Nau mai, haere mai, piki mai, kaki mai, tēnā koto katoa. Ko Jane Treadwell, hoi toko inua. I am the Executive Director of the Education Partnership and Innovation Trust, more commonly known as EPIT, and it's um, a great opportunity to join this discussion today. We're very thrilled that you're able to uh, be part of this. We believe it's a um, beginning of a journey and discussion on the exploration of distance learning opportunities in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, before we get started, I'm just going to open with a karakia. Tutawa mai ironga, tutawa mai iraro, tutawa mai iroto, tutawa mai iwaho. Kia tau ai, ke te Māori tu, te Māori ora, kia te katoa, homie, kuie, hai pie. So I'm going to hand it over now to Michael and Derek to introduce themselves, and then we'll begin the session. Michael. Sure. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be back with you guys. Um, I'm looking through the uh, audience that we've got here, and I'm seeing a lot of folks that I had the opportunity to spend some time with over the, uh, the last bit of March and uh, first uh, few weeks of April while I was uh, over there doing some data collection. Uh, so I'm Michael Barber. I'm a professor of instructional design and the director of faculty development at Toro University of California in lovely Vallejo. Uh, where it is sunny and probably about 36, 37 degrees here today, uh, Celsius. So uh, not to brag or anything, because I know you guys are heading into the fall. Um, and uh, <clears throat> depending on whereabouts you are, it might not be quite that lovely today. Uh, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Derek, who's uh, my partner in this uh, research journey. Hi, hey, thank you, Mike. Kia ora koutou. Nami inui, kia koutou katoa, ko te roku no toko ingoa, and it's uh, really great to be on this call. Uh, and well, while Michael was here, as he said, for the month, um, just really cementing the the relationship in terms of just the background and knowledge that um, we we share together. This is an exciting project to be part of, and um, uh, probably will really help set us up in New Zealand in terms of providing a platform from which we can uh, we can draw understanding about our direction in this distance online blended virtual learning. I'll let Michael describe more about that shortly. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you both. Derek, um, would you mind just giving us a, a short summary of the history of e-learning, distance learning in New Zealand so it sets the scene and then we can understand uh, from Michael how this research came about. Thanks. Yeah, kia ora. I think um, just briefly, it's important that we set all of this in a context of the history. Uh, and there's going to be a quite a section in the paper in the research that we do that outlines this. But very briefly, uh, New Zealand is um, one of three countries along with Australia and um, Canada that's got a very long history of uh, distance education in the compulsory school sector, dating right back to the 1920s. Uh, and significantly there, of course, was the correspondence school, as it was known, Te Kura now. And that's continued right through. But there was a there was a real sea change in the 1990s when um, telecommunications were in their early stages of development. And in the 90s, we started to see in the in the age of tomorrow's schools, a lot of organizations and institutions look uh, outside of what they were currently doing to make themselves more attractive, more appealing, have a broader reach. And with the advent of telecommunications, um, we saw things like audio graphics being used. So the very first uh, clusters of schools began in the 1990s and started to, to work like that. And of course, mid 1990s, the World Wide Web came to New Zealand. We started seeing schools play around with things like flip learning and uh, the use of um, technologies like that to connect with students outside of school. So a lot of these emergent ideas happened there. Then we came to the 2000s. And by this time, the World Wide Web was really starting to, to take hold. Uh, and we had the first video conferencing clusters still using conventional telecommunications technologies, but uh, merging into then using web based telecommunications and web based video conferencing. And that started to have quite wide appeal and we saw all sorts of groups and organizations begin to use that and again a lot of it was really ground up stuff happening in local schools 
doing projects uh, nationally and internationally with each other. And then, of course, COVID hit and we, we are into the 2020s uh, where we are now. And suddenly there was an emergence of uh, interest in how we communicate with students when they are unable to connect with school. And the terminology, you know, emergency, remote learning, hybrid learning, these sorts of things emerged. Uh, and on top of that, in, in addition to the driver uh, being about providing wider, broader, more equitable access, we've also had other drivers right through that period uh, where people are looking to get the, the economic or competitive edge as well and establish themselves uh, in a way that, that gives them a niche in the market. So it's been quite an exciting ride, an exciting journey. And so many of the institutions, organizations, schools and so forth that have been interviewed and included in this research have been part of that, uh, part of that journey. And, and so the aim now is really to kind of provide an environment scan, a snapshot and, and a, a, a baseline from which we can only grow further. Kia Hand over to Michael. Yeah, it's um, one of the things that that Derek left out there that I think is 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 kind of critical in terms of the contextual aspect of of the work that we're doing was the fact that a lot of this activity was happening, but we hadn't seen the the research and and the literature around what was going on with that. And that became important at times, because if you think back to just before COVID, when um, we were looking at the potential of creating these communities of online, uh, online schools, or communities of online learning, sorry, these cools that were oftentimes being proposed by policymakers, really devoid of any research basis for them, and not to knock those policymakers, because the reality was, in many cases, we didn't have a rich research base to be able to, to draw hmm. upon when it came to the specific New Zealand context. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I, I've, uh, I think that Derek, uh, well, you know, when I first proposed the fact that um, I was going to be on sabbatical once again, um, and some of you in the room will remember, I guess it was 12, 13 years ago now, I had another sabbatical and uh, spent, I think it was 13, 14 weeks with you guys um, traveling up and down the, the, the North and South Island, although mostly the South Island, to be honest with you. Um, and um, uh, that was, I guess, one of the, the first sort of national studies that we had that looked at what was happening. Now, at the time, it was in through the, the lens or within the context of a document that the Ministry of Education had been developing for almost a decade at that point, the Learning Communities Online Handbook. Um, and so the recommendations that came out of that and the findings that came out of that were done through the lens of that particular book and this idea of how we moved from these emerging uh, ground up kinds of programs to more sustainable and mature organizations that were self-funding or self-sustaining. Um, this time we're in a completely different context. Um, you know, we, we've just come out of a, a uh, uh, as Derek mentioned, you know, the, the whole COVID um, experience, um, fiasco, some might say, and, uh, you know, some programs, some schools, some organizations did better than others, but as someone who, you know, is in this space pretty much worldwide, I, I, I've yet to find any organization that I think did well during uh, this period, even some that were set up beforehand that they could have done quite well. Um, I'm thinking of a couple of Canadian jurisdictions in particular that um, really were pre-COVID in a position that could have done some really interesting things during COVID and just uh, failed to capitalize on any of them. Um, while there were some shining lights, um, they were few and far between, and, and oftentimes it was the best of the worst uh in in within the context of what we were seeing um so this particular work um came out of all of that kind of background with the idea that much of what we had talked about and had recommended 
uh, in the work that we had done over a decade ago has come to pass. Now, it didn't necessarily get implemented in purposeful ways. It's just um, over time, that's kind of how the the virtual learning, distance learning in the school sector just kind of evolved in that manner. Um, so it was time to really take a look at what was happening and also try to chart a course for the future. And uh, those are the, the two studies that we've been focusing upon. Um, the, the first one we're, we're actually hoping to have um, ready for release probably in the next, I'm going to say, three to four weeks. So hopefully around the, the middle of June, um, which is probably about two weeks later than we had initially intended. But uh, part of that is because we've actually learned of, uh, of additional programs as we've been uh, doing the work and, and talking with folks. Um, or additional schools, I should say, because uh, I want to be purposeful with the, the language I've been using, because one of the things that um, we've started in the report, and as Derek mentioned, uh, we are going to have a significant history section in the report, because while there have been a number of places where parts of this history have been written, uh, we don't really have any one spot where the complete history of, of distance learning uh, in New Zealand has really been charted. So we're going to uh, attempt to at least uh, put an honest effort into that. Uh, the other thing that we start the report with is to try to uh, use or to generate or to come to some agreement around uh, a common set of terms, a, a set of nomenclature that we can use around this, because uh, depending upon um, who it is that you speak with and sort of where they sit within the, the educational ecosystem, um, oftentimes we get uh, five people that will use five different terms to mean, you know, referring to the exact same thing. We also have others where we get five different people that use the exact same term, but they're referring to five very different contexts. Um, so trying to come up with a common language so that uh, we at least have a way to speak to each other and everyone sort of understands what the other person is referring to. Uh, it was really, um, actually, it took a bit of time for us, and that's one of the reasons uh, why the report is coming out a little, the initial report's coming out a little bit later. Um, I don't know where you want me to head from here, Jean. I think I'll turn it back to you and let you start to sure. probe us a little bit and guide us some. Sure, thank you. Um, Derek, you've been around uh, e-learning, distance learning in New Zealand a wee while. You've, you've been a, um, aware of what's happening across the ecosystem. In your initial conversations with Michael and the interview um, interviews that were taking place, were there any aha moments? Well, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question. I think um, for me, there were there were actually there were many uh, hows. One of them, as Michael has mentioned, is just the, the diversity of language that was being used and the understandings that people were applying to that, uh, that were emerging from ground up practical experience, which reinforces why uh, you know what Michael's saying here. Our intent to draw that together so that we're we're starting to develop a common language. But I think there were there was a bit of an aha as as we started actually looking at the um, at the sheer range of um, groups, organisations, and sometimes even individuals that were pressing into this space and looking to establish themselves. <laughs> sometimes with a very specific audience, you know, very defined. Others kind of canvassing a wider audience. Uh, but it just reinforced for me how the landscape, particularly in this COVID and post-COVID um, time has just blossomed and and um, is in dire need of this sort of uh, research behind it. Thank you. Michael, um, just to clarify and maybe set some parameters, this research is looking at New Zealand organisations that are offering distance learning, not international ones that are offering learning here, or is it a hybrid mix? Uh, it's a little of both. So um, any... We were trying to capture any organization that either was based in New Zealand and also serving New Zealand students, or those that were based internationally, but also serving New Zealand students. Now with the latter, I guess in both cases, we were only interested in their New Zealand student population. 
Uh, so there were some that fell into both categories that had some students from New Zealand, some from Australia, some from various Asian nations. So as we did, uh, particularly the uh, the 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 survey of the current activity, we asked them to respond to to the questions that we had on that particular survey, focusing only upon their New Zealand students. Um, so when we were asking them about resourcing, when we were asking them about activity delivery models, those types of things, again focusing just upon the students that were being served there. Thank you. And and from a sort of a range of offerings, um, were they using everything from predetermined content that a student would self-serve all the way through to AI? What were you seeing by way of content delivery or mechanism of delivery? Um, well, there's a couple of different models. And, and interestingly, they, they oftentimes aligned with the types of, of providers that we were looking at. Um, so if you look at Takura as an example, and I often use them just as a, a category on their own, because from a legislative standpoint, um, you know, they're, the Education and, and Training Act uh, says that there can be distant schools, but there's only one distant school. So Takura are in a category by themselves. Um, and if you look at the their particular delivery model, they uh, use an asynchronous delivery model, so not in real time. So content is loaded into a learning management system. In the case of Takura, they use um, Blackboard or sorry, uh, D, uh, Desire to Learn's Brightspace or D2L Brightspace. Um, and the content, essentially, the teachers in the program are the ones who in many cases have designed that content beforehand. And it's not an independent study. And that's one of the, the things that I, I wanna sort of underscore because there are some that do, that use that model. And in all honesty, Takura historically had used largely that independent study model. You, you know, the packets would be sent to your home. You would work on it on your own and you would send the packets back. Um, what's happening now is that there's a lot more interaction between the student and their tutor and the student and the content within this learning management system. Um, so the, the system allows for a, a lot more of that um, engagement that didn't happen in the old sort of correspondence education model. Um, a lot of the um, other programs that would fall into the public sphere. So I'm thinking the health schools, the the clusters from the, the virtual learning network, uh, um, the, the Deaf Education New Zealand programs that are being offered. A lot of those are relying primarily upon synchronous instruction and then the curation of asynchronous resources. And I, I use that a little bit separately than the actual um, you know, asynchronous online content where you've essentially designed the entire course to be taken without having to interact with the instructor, although the instructor can be quite active compared to um, resources that have been put online to help supplement and guide the student. But really much of the instruction is being done in a synchronous manner, kind of like what we're doing here today. And, and oftentimes it's Zoom or, or, or you know Teams or Google Meets that are used for that purpose. Um, the uh, private schools that are offering online uh, options in this, this space, and in some cases they are private schools that are completely online, in some cases they are private schools that have a brick and mortar component, but also offer an online component. Um, interestingly, the ones that are 100% online, they don't have any face-to-face um, -face or brick and mortar component, most of those follow that, that synchronous model again. Um, although they still have much more on the asynchronous side, so it's less a curation of resources and more of a, a using a learning management system, putting course content. So kind of taking the Takura model, but also overlaying the synchronous instruction on top of it. Um, those that tend to be brick and mortar programs that have an online component, those in many cases go back to that independent study model. Um, you know, in many cases, they are purchasing a curriculum from a vendor, um, in many of them a vendor in the U.S., um, and they are specifically going out and targeting 
uh, in many cases, uh, homeschooled students who uh, are interested in a, a more Christian or biblical um, training um, education and providing them with a, a they're not necessarily the old paper packets that would get mailed, but they're electronic versions of those. Derek, looking at the um, growth in homeschooling post COVID, were you seeing anything or um, was there anything around the use of the distance learning that was particularly focused on the homeschool environment? Oh, well, certainly, probably not specifically related to the research that we're doing, but in the gamut of it and the things that we discovered, um, New Zealand, as in other parts of the world, in that post-COVID area, there was evidence of, of a lot of people choosing to homeschool students. Um, you know, some driven for all sorts of agendas from fear, from wanting to be differentiated, even through to the conspiracy theory end of the spectrum. So there are all sorts of reasons for doing that. Um, and as Michael said, there's there was suddenly also an exposure to prepackaged curriculums that they could just buy into to conveniently sort of fill that gap. Um, so yes, we've seen some of that in New Zealand. I'm not sure from what I've seen that that's uh, you know a lot of that hasn't necessarily sustained or been sustained, and people are going back. Um, Michael might have some more specific data from some of the things he's discovered, but that would be my view. Well, just to follow up on that, it's interesting because a lot of these programs, um, you know, to your question specifically about the, the COVID induced um, nature of it, many of these programs first began in 2021 or 2022. Yeah. Um, actually, I, I would say that the, the majority of ones we found uh, look like that, particularly those that, that tended to have more of a, a religious focus to them. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, we've also seen that at, at least one of the half dozen or so, the eight or I think it's eight or nine that we've identified, at least one of them hasn't been able to sustain itself more than a year or two. And there's another one that has been around for a couple of years and still hasn't been able to attract any enrollment. Um, so many of these are, are, are disappearing as quickly as they are appearing within this, this particular environment. So, so then moving on from um, the homeschooling environment, are you able to see, because one of, one of the challenges we see frequently in the work that we support is the digital equity lens, which is um, unless you've got the devices, unless you've got the internet connectivity, distance learning, online learning generally is, is nigh on impossible. Was there any evidence of um, device access or internet connectivity, especially thinking for more rural areas of New Zealand um, turning up in this research as a problem or as a, a solution that's been provided by these providers? This is it's a, it's an interesting question because it actually, it, it moves us a little bit into sort of the, the second study that, that we've been working on um, that, again, many of the folks in the, the room participated in. Um, so the, while the first study was looking at sort of the current state of affairs and, and for us current statement, the most recent school year, uh, the other study was looking at essentially what needs to happen over the next, you know, X number of years. And you can insert whatever X you want into that for us to have a, uh, an education system that can leverage all of these things that we're seeing in pockets now so that you know when the next natural disaster hits or when the next pandemic hits or when just parents you know want to choose a variety of different options for their children how can they leverage all of these things and this idea of, of uh, you know this notion of digital equity was something that came out very clearly in those conversations, because that's one of the areas I think that we we still, and this is not uh, specific to New Zealand, I can honestly say I've seen this in most jurisdictions I'm working in, um, we've still got a lot of work to do in this area. Um, if we can get folks into schools themselves, uh, the work that's been done over the past decade in connecting schools and getting high-speed access and devices into the hands of students when they're in the school building, 
has increased significantly. And it's one of the reasons why you've seen organizations like Takura that have been able to shift from the old correspondence model to this robust online learning management system. It's one of the reasons why you've seen growth within the virtual learning network clusters, because we don't have the connectivity and bandwidth issues in the schools that we used to have. Um, so their ability to access these programs uh, aren't hindered if we can get them into the building. The challenge is, you know, of those things I listed, you know, pandemic, natural disaster, just choice. It's only the last one that really has kids in the building. Uh, the other ones, you know, kids are, are going to need to take advantage of this um, at home. And, and that's still an area that um, we really haven't made that many strides on. There's, there's still a, a significant um, um, gap within digital access, um, both in terms of access to the tools, but then the ability to use them. Uh, I, I remember having a couple of conversations when I was over there with folks about how even during the pandemic, folks would, you know, get access to, you know, the, they'd get a Chromebook sent to their, their home by the government. They'd get a little hotspot sent to their home by the government. Um, but that also requires them to have the ability to, you know, to pay for the electricity that's going to fund that, you know, that's going to, you know, keep those things going. And there are many cases that's a decision that, you know, parents um, struggle with, you know, where are we going to find the money to pay for that? Um, even just the, the ability to set some of those things up, um, you know, I, 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 I'm, I guess, a little bit advantaged in that I've had a computer in front of me since I've been about six years old. Um, my mother, when she gets a new phone, it, you know, she's got to go to my, you know, my niece in order to get it set up for her because she doesn't have a clue how to set it up. Um, you know, you've got these devices going into the homes uh, and, and parents and, and students, you know, not having the technical capabilities to even get it up off the ground, um, you know, and, and up and running uh, from the get go. And, and these are all issues that that are still prevalent throughout the system. Um, even just something as basic as if we assumed every single home in, in New Zealand had adequate internet access, every single home in New Zealand had adequate devices, um, you still have the issue of the, the, the role of the parent in these more flexible learning environments. Um, you know, and we saw this during the, the pandemic very clearly, and it's, it's something that we continue to struggle with now. Um, you know, does the parent need to be there all the time? How much instructional support should they provide? How much technical support should they be expected to provide? What do schools and, and these online programs do in terms of orienting and training parents for what their role should be and the level of technical acumen that they need to have in order to help support their child or even just what they want them to do in terms of supporting their child? Um, you know, in many cases, the the online and distance programs that we've got just aren't really doing these kinds of, of, of things yet. Um, but it's something that is on everyone's radar. I can't think of a single interview that I did while I was, you know, for the four weeks that I was there where the issue of digital equity and digital access didn't come up. Can so I add something? Yeah, something. I was going to say, Derek, um, I think I, I've got a question for you, but I'll let you add first. Well, I was just going to um, add, for me, that's one of the intriguing things that's come out of this research and, and in the discussions with Michael that we had many of while he was staying here. Um, it, it, it really has raised, for me, uh, the, the, uh, an awareness that's growing of, of how a system-wide view of this needs to be. That you know, We have to have a view end-to-end -end when we're thinking of providing distance online virtual education that we do with schools. Uh, you know, because we think of buildings, we think of the power. But in, in the virtual environment, this end-to-end -end thing isn't something that we naturally fall into. So that was something that really came out for me. And there are sort of two ends of that that uh, really I'm hoping our research will be able to help inform uh, in the New Zealand context. And one is that uh, it's not just about of taking what we do in a school environment and just shipping it on online, which is what we saw a lot of happen. So there's a, there are some really significant things around pedagogy and training, and that includes what Michael's talking about, the role of parents and role of other people assisting uh, in, in that uh, education space. The other end of it is that we've got groups 
uh, like the v VLNs and others who are operating and attempting to do some great work, and many of them are in this space, but in the absence of a really significantly well put together policy environment in New Zealand that supports that and uh, relates to the funding and the support. So many of these groups that have been interviewed and look, they're all they're all talking about the same thing in terms of their future is the the insecurity that exists around the funding, the policy, the 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 ability to support and maintain them. They they are all still very seen as periphery rather than central. My question of you, Derek, was going to be: You work across a number of schools. You work um, inside the ministry as well. What um, role do you see the schools? playing in educating the parent population. To Michael's point, there is an underlying digital tech skill set you need that is not necessarily content related, but the mechanics of getting things to connect and then function to have the children uh, be able to use distance learning as a virtual op option for them. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question because um, it's you know, to Michael's point about you know, imagine a future where all of this existed, you've still got the um, the challenge of how you use it. And it's one of those things that you can't uh, you can't mandate that. you know you, it's it's a human behavior thing. you can't mandate. It. But there are some interesting uh, supports that we observed and heard about that are starting to happen. I might like um, groups and organizations taking a responsible approach here are thinking quite seriously about, the role of parents, for instance, and they are developing the the support materials and the guidance and the scaffolds for parents, recognizing, of course, that not every student has parents who are available and able to work with students. So you've got some whose parents feeling um, that they don't have the educational level of um, that, that that's required to support their students. So how can that happen? You've got other parents who uh, just simply don't have the time because of their commitments to work and to, uh, and we saw that a lot in, in COVID, of course, where you had frontline parents um, having to leave their, their students in the care of others. So there's a lot of reconceptualizing really required in the system to start thinking about where those, those kind of roadblocks and barriers might be and how we circumnavigate them, how we rethink a system and what that support is what support is required and how those support requirements are then met. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, on that point, you know, uh, I mentioned at the top of my introduction, I'm a professor of instructional design and, and the basic premise of instructional design is basically you're looking to identify a gap. You know, here's what our desired condition is. Here's what our actual condition is. And, and you know, what is the gap between the two? And there are only three ways that, that you can close a gap. Um, you know, the gap is either caused by a lack of, of resources, by a lack of knowledge, or a lack of will. You know, the lack of resources, that's, that's, that's a government issue. You know, the policies, the devices, the connectivity, you know, the funding, the stability that Derek is talking about, that's, that's a government issue. The lack of knowledge, that's a, a training issue. That's, you know, how do we, how do our colleges of, of education and our teacher training programs, you know, train educators so that they can do just as good a job in the face-to-face -face classroom with 30 kids in front of them as they can in an asynchronous learning management system with 30 kids enrolled in that or in a Zoom session where they've, you know, or any synchronous tool session, you know, how can they essentially go from medium to medium without having any sort of disruption in the quality or continuity of their instruction? What sort of uh, training do we provide to parents as to what their role should be and the expectations for them and how to do some of these things? Um, and then the last one is will. And unfortunately, that's the one that as an instructional designer, you can't do anything about. Uh, I can't make you want to do these things. I can provide you with the knowledge on how to do it. I can give you the tools to do it. Uh, but at the end of the day, the will is something that, you know, we've got to make sure that, you know, that folks want to do it. And and one of the, I, I suspect, I said, there's nothing we can do about it. But in all honesty, I think there are some smaller things we could do. Um, one is to make it, make it easy enough so that it doesn't take that much effort for them to do it. 
um, you know, the easier it is, the much more, you know, the, the more willing people are to do these things, uh, particularly if it's something that that they understand the rationale as to why they're doing these things. And, and then that gets into the value proposition. You know, why are some of these things valuable to do? Um, you know, many of us uh, in this call, and I'm, I'm looking through the names over on the side, so I know a lot of them are of an age where, you know, we were either raised in or we raised our own children in an environment where we valued homework as an example. So we made sure that our kids did their homework or our parents made sure that we did homework because they placed a value on that. Um, you know, based upon a, a lot of the, the research that's coming out now, plus, you know, just society being what it is these days, there's not as much value placed on homework, which is why the teachers in the room will attest to the fact that there's as many kids coming in the morning that don't have it done as there are that have it done. Um, you know, so how do we we get that value proposition in there as well? Um, so I, wa I wanted to add that because I thought it was a, a nice tie in. Plus, it, it also looks at there are some aspects of this that as much as we can do, there's still hills that we just can't climb. Um, and no matter what research we do, no matter what backing or support we have from the various agencies or, uh, you know, government or programs or what have you, um, you know, there are just some things that that we have to rely upon the goodwill of others. Thinking about the, um, the overall distance learning ecosystem, how do we maintain quality control? How do we ensure um, consistency of delivery and also student achievement um, and ensuring that there is um, some level of oversight that is actually meeting the needs of the New Zealand curriculum. I'm thinking in particular of the ones where you mentioned they're bringing courses directly in from overseas. Well, I mean, uh, I guess there's, there's two ways to answer that question. Um, the the first is you know there are and this is not a, a new zealand specific thing because this happens wherever you go if if i were to move to um new zealand today living here in california and if i had kids one of the first things that whatever school system i brought them into would do is they would look at the courses that they've taken thus far and try to figure out how that lines up with the new zealand curriculum and you know what they can sort of give them credit for if you will or what they can say that they've already completed and then focus upon the things that they still need to take um, that kind of process is available for any of these programs and in fact many of the programs that we're seeing used are ones that um, are already commonly accepted uh, so one of the 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 ones we see a lot of is the uh, the the pearson international uh, cambridge curriculum um, another one that we're seeing a lot of, although I think much less of it, is the accelerated Christian education uh, curriculum um, as ones that are coming from outside and being brought in. And, and at some point in time, folks have gone through and lined those up against the New Zealand standards. And, and if there are gaps that are there, they're known gaps. So the, the programs that are using those, the schools that are using those, can just address them on an ad hoc basis. Um, the other way to answer that question is, um, how are we doing that in a brick and mortar environment? Yeah, yeah that's right. You know, how are we assuring that, you know, some, um, you know, large urban high school in Wellington is doing uh, just as good a job as some rural all grade school up in Northland uh, or down in, in Otago? I mean, there obviously when you get into, you know, the, the senior secondary and we start looking at these external exams, that's one of the ways in which we can have some measure of quality control. But with the exception of, of that, really, I mean, if you're looking at the, the younger students, um, the quality of education they're getting at school A could be very, very different than the quality of education that's being provided at school B. And I always find it interesting funny um insulting maybe when folks outside of uh, of the the field of, of distance learning that's oftentimes the first question that they ask when it comes to distance education well how can we ensure that students are learning as much and i'm like no no classroom teacher ever gets asked that 
And why is that? Because, you know, I've, well, everyone in this room has been in a lot of face-to-face -face classrooms. And I'm sure that you've learned a lot from many of the teachers you've had. And I'm sure there's some teachers that you've had that you learned nothing from. I think the other thing from a system view that I'd like to add to, to Michael uh, here is, how do we how do we do that in a way that ensures uh, quality from the perspective of equity and achieving goals and all that sort of thing, but without stifling the innovation that has actually been a hallmark of the development of what we've got at the moment? And, uh, and if I might comment, you know, at the moment in New Zealand, we've got conflicting philosophies driving the way that we think because we've got uh, a perception that uh, supported by data, you might argue, of a, a decline in quality, a decline in achievement in certain areas that has given rise now to uh, a regime of much more um, managed and imposed and, and mandated response uh, to, to ensure you know, a consistency of quality and so forth. But on the other hand, from the same government, we've got an alternate philosophy that's saying schools are feeling strangled by the, the impositions that are being made on them. So we want to create an opportunity for them to sit outside the system and to innovate and to do things in ways that, um, that allow them to pursue those dreams. And I think that's symptomatic of the tension that's in our system always. It's, it just is highlighted right at the moment, but it's always been there. And that's where I think uh, coming back to Michael's point and looking at um, you know those three drivers, that that central one about how we how we take responsibility as a profession for ensuring that those things are addressed. You know the 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 quality issues and maintaining standards and also building the groundwork of sustainability and training people to to be efficient in this way, but not at the expense entirely of being innovative and ensuring that we we are. Cut, cutting edge in, in the ways that we need to be. It's interesting you mentioned that, Derek, because, uh, you know, the particularly the idea of, you know, some of the, the international benchmarks that we use, you know, these really, I mean, when you're looking at these types of things, they're human constructs. You know, we've decided that these are things that we feel are important. And for whatever reason, like as an example, we've decided as a society, or at least some countries anyway, that, that uh, our performance on the, the PISA tests are a measure that we want to judge by. Um, it's interesting to note that the, 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 school, the countries that do, um, and, and now this research is a bit dated, it's probably about a decade, decade and a half old now, um, but if you look at the countries that score at the top of the tables on the, the PISA test, they tend to have much lower uh, rates on tests of creativity than, than those that perform average or poorly on the PISA exam. Hmm. Um, you know, so we can make sure that we're scoring really high you know, in math and reading and writing and a lot of these other rote knowledges, or we can say we're going to score really high in our ability to be creative and, and innovative. Um, and unfortunately, in many cases, we can't score high on both because there's an inverse relationship between the two. Um, you know, so a lot of that, and this gets to Derek's point about, you know, how do we, we individualize a lot of this because yes, there are some basic knowledge that I think all students should have. Um, you know, the, the I, that's the whole idea behind a curriculum. There's a basic level of understanding that um, we want all educated citizens within our environment to have. Um, but beyond that basic knowledge, um, you know, where do we draw the line between everyone must have, you know, X, Y, and Z? Maybe they just all need X and they can pick the other two letters on their own. And we just have to, as educators, figure out a way to have some consistency between all of the people that decide to pick P or that decide to pick Q or L or R. So building on that um, innovation creativity element um, and your second piece of research is focused on 
the future opportunities and possibilities. What role do you see disruptive technologies, AI, and that kind of capability that's now coming in to our classrooms, but in particular in the distance learning space? What, what advantages, um, what opportunities do you think there may be for learning in New Zealand using those in a distance learning context? I think um, what the question, uh, I'm butting in here ahead of you, Michael, I'm sure you have others to add, but the question you ask is kind of, uh, points to the other major tension that exists in our system. So one is that standardization versus creative and the openness. But the other one is that's been happening right through the distance ed kind of history here is the emphasis on personalization that, that, that we are now seeing um, impact a lot of our education system. So there, there's been an argument, for example, right back from the 1920s that one of the advantages of traditional distance education was that it catered for the individual, right? And that the individual learner um, was getting things in their own time, in their own place, at their own pace, and so forth. Now, um, it's, it's curious to me that as more and more time has gone ahead, um, the economic imperatives around distance education has seen it fall, in my view, a lot more into the one size fits all, the massification of education uh, because that's where you get the economic benefit the more people you can get on the more you can massify that and so i think that's always been a tension in the classroom where we've chosen to put students into groups of 30 or 25 or whatever uh, and the time and ability of, of teachers to work individually with them has been uh, you know limited even though we've talked about personalization so coming then to the question that you're asking about the role of technology and emerging technologies that's where we've seen over the last decade or so um, where even within traditional learning management systems there are simple things like quizzes that provide a response to a to a um, an answer that might be given is, is sort of an indication of that personalized approach, even though it's pre-programmed and, and it's all in there. So we sit on the verge now, where instead of having pre-programmed responses, we've got the ability of AI to provide through chatbots and things, a, pro, a, a response that's much more personalized. It takes into account the nuance of that student's um, you know, performance to date. And there are a lot of things that are starting to happen um, that are that are quite exciting in that regard, I think. Um, but but the, the challenge is going to be to see the extent to which they actually um, work successfully in favour of the student or where they just subsume the system and we get sucked into something that perhaps isn't as desirable. Well, to, to follow up on what Derek was saying, and, and I want to come back to the nature of your question as well. Um, because I think it underlies uh, something that we've been seeing in the field for a long time. But to to continue Derek's response, I mean, if you can imagine an environment, and, and I remember I was a doc student back in 03 to 07, and we had an assignment. Uh, the folks from the ministry that are in the room here will remember this story from when I visited with them. Uh, we had an assignment in one of my social studies ed classes where we were supposed to describe what a uh, what a classroom might look like 10 years from now. And we had, because we had a very sort of uh, um, small L liberal uh, faculty member teaching the class, we had a lot of sort of dystopian kinds of things because of the, the neoliberal assault that was happening on education in the United States. But there was one that I thought was quite creative where he basically, he talked about this notion of, you know, being able to sort of walk up to this panel on the wall and to basically ask the panel a couple of questions and the panel would start asking it questions and using the artificial intelligence that it had built in it could figure out what the child knew about a particular topic and what it didn't know about a topic and then because it's got all of this pre-programmed content that's tagged appropriately being able to pull that content out in a format that the student would enjoy. Um, so, it, you know, it, it might be, you know, a video based thing. It might be something that they would read. It might be something where they need to interact with, uh, you know, a, a fellow student or a group of students. It might be where they want it to be taught directly by a teacher. Um, you know, but essentially trying to figure out, you know, what it is that they knew, what it is that they didn't know, provide them just instruction on what they didn't know and provide it in a medium that 
was something that, you know, they were comfortable in learning in um, or that they wanted to learn that particular topic in. Um, and, and to me, I think that's really where we're going. Now, you asked about the role of, of, of distance learning and some of these digital technologies in this. And that, I think, if you think back to, say, the and folks in the room will, will remember this, back to some of the earlier work that Derek and I did together, where we talked about how you had distance learning and face-to-face -face learning, and then you had them sort of merging a bit. And we were trying to move towards this idea of networked schools because, you know, distance learning and online learning was always seen as something separate from face-to-face -face learning or um, to use, uh, I know Rachel was in the room earlier. I know Rachel and Rick oftentimes, you know, talk about the fact that like, when are we going to get from virtual learning to just learning? And, and that I think underlies some of the, 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 the tension that we've got in here. And, and it goes back to even the earlier question about uh, assessment and standards. You know, the idea that, um, you know, distance learning, virtual learning, online learning, whatever terminology you want to have to it is something that's separate from the system. That's something that is in addition to the system. It's not just part of the ecosystem. And that's really, I think, where we want to get to at a you know, with a, a lot of this as we look to the futures, how can we have it so that it's seamless, so that we don't talk about the modality anymore. We're just talking about, you know, the the act and it just happens to occur in one modality or another. Yeah. So thinking about the research and what um, outcomes you'd like to see from it, recognizing that you've got two pieces underway at the moment, where do you what what's next and what sort of actionable um outcomes do you think will play out over the next um six twelve months well uh, as i mentioned at the top we're we're getting very close now to being in position on that first study to be able to release the report for the 2023 year um We've got about 95% of the first draft written. Uh, Derek is going through and doing a lot of the revising of, of my initial drafts. Uh, then we're going to be sharing those drafts with some of the uh, principles that are involved in, and by principles, I mean ELS, not ALS, um, that are involved in the, uh, the, the research just to make sure that there's no um, errors of, of understanding or accuracy that are there. I'm hoping to have that released in the report format um, sometime in mid June ish. Um, we have uh, the Flexible Learning Association of New Zealand, FLANS, uh, has agreed to give up uh, a portion of their website to host this project. Uh, so um, hopefully in the next actually week, we're going to gain access to their website and be able to start to create a, a, a living resource where those reports can live, but also where we can update them into the future. Um, as you're aware, and I know some of the folks in the room are aware, maybe some aren't, um, the Educational Partnership and Innovation Trust has provided us with some funding to help offset the data collection costs for the individual programs so that we can actually go back once we release the 23 report and get data from the 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022 school, two school years so that um, and we will start to reach out to those folks probably as soon as we finalize the 2023 stuff uh, to get that work on the go. Uh, in an ideal world, we'd probably get that work finished around the end of August um, so that by that, I guess, roughly three and a half months from now, we would have five years of data from all of these distance programs so that we can see sort of the, you know, both, if you look at the 2019, that would be a pre-pandemic. Then we've got a few pandemic years and 2023 is sort of the first kind of post-pandemic year. So the new normal, if you will. So to give us a sense to be able to track that uh, data. Um, so, and then while we're doing that, um, or at least while we're waiting for the individual programs to send us that, that historical data, uh, Derek and I will continue to pick and poke at the report for the second, uh, study. Um, and in an ideal world, that'll come out about the same time that the historical stuff would. So, you know, end of August, September-ish kind of time frame. Um, and one of the things that driving that in terms of timeline is um, 
the uh, next Flans conference that's that's coming up. I can't remember the exact date off the top of my head, but I know it's August or September sometime. So in our mind, it would be really nice to be able to have at least the the initial report on the first study and the actual report on the second study both done by the time we walk into well I shouldn't say we by the time Derek walks into the that conference space I think it's Auckland this year um uh, so that you know he actually has a finished product to talk about and then moving forward um we would like this to become an annual thing uh, and not necessarily the future study part but the actual what is the state of of the system on an annual basis um, you know, the United States and, and Canada both have those types of annual studies. Um, in the U.S., it's while well, they've missed a number of years, they started doing it back in, I think it was 2004. Um, I started leading the Canadian one back in 07. Um, you know, so we've got, again, coming on, well, basically two decades worth of stuff in the U.S. And, and almost two decades worth of stuff in Canada. So it would be nice to be able to start the process of, getting two decades or more of stuff in New Zealand, although my sort of ultimate goal would be a decade from now not needing to do this anymore because it's become a seamless part of the system that we envision from that second study. Thank you. Derek, any final comments from you? Uh, no, other than to say it's been a delight working with Michael on this because of his, his international knowledge and just being able to the two of us work together to make this happen and to reinforce that the importance of that um, uh, longitudinal view of what's happening in New Zealand. Uh, I think we in New Zealand, and it probably is happening elsewhere as well, but in the policy development in New Zealand, we've really been caught in a cycle of very, very short term thinking based on the sort of snapshot of now instead of that longitudinal uh, view of what we, what's been happening and where we actually want to be and want to go. So I see this as, as potentially quite a seminal work for us here in New Zealand and delighted to be a part of it. Thank you. Well, as I said at the top of the hour, um, a link to this recording will be shared after we've um, had a chance to do some editing and get it out to everyone who's registered. Uh, we will also be looking to bring Derek and Michael back, probably September timeframes, to actually have a longer open Q&A, because I think this is a really interesting topic as to how you combine, and I love the construct of removing the concept of distance learning and just calling it learning, because we always talk about the future of learning, uh, and that's bricks and mortar as well as, as distance learning. Um, any questions you might have as a result of this session, feel free to either add them in the chat or email them to us at team at epit.org.nz and we will make sure they get through to both Michael and, and Derek just as a, a piece of uh, background information, but also to help frame up the next conversation. Um, our event series continues, and if you check out our website, you'll find um, other events we've got on the calendar. The next one is looking at entrepreneurial and digital school skills for senior students in high school. Um, but I'd like to thank both Michael and Derek for participating this morning and sharing your interim um, findings and your thoughts. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone who's joined the webinar today for participating, recognising that um, this time frame on a Friday is not always the best. Um, and I'd just like to close with a karakia. Kua mutu a matu mahi mō tēnei wā, mnākitia mai mātou katoa, O mato hoa, o mato fanao, ayo kete arangi. Kiara. <laughs>